I am calling the Finance Administration Committee meeting to order. Um, first order of business is roll call. Teresa Taylor. Here. Richard Costigan. Here. Rob Fechner. Good morning. Richard Gillahan. Here. Henry Jones. Here. David Miller. Here. Lynn Paquin for Betty Yee. Here. All right. We are um, moving directly to agenda item number 6C as we have a time, a certain start time of 9 a.m. It is now 9 a.m. on April 17th, 2018. We're located in the auditorium at the CalPERS headquarters, Lincoln Plaza North, Sacramento, California. This is the time and place which has been noticed for public hearing on the proposed adoption of amendments to Title II, California Code of Regulations, Article II, Section 554.7, which makes changes that would require voters to sign the perjury statement on the return envelope instead of on the paper ballot. This hearing is being transcribed for the administrative record. I am Teresa Taylor, Chair of the CalPERS Finance and Administration Committee. <coughs> Before the committee opens the floor to accept public testimony and comments on the proposed regulations, I would like to briefly go over the rules governing the rulemaking process. The purpose of this public hearing is to allow the public to present testimony regarding the proposed regulatory action. The committee will listen attentively to any testimony which is presented, all comments which are received today, as well as any written comments received during the public comment period, will receive a response from CalPERS in writing as part of the final rulemaking file. The rulemaking file is a public record and is open for public review during the rulemaking process. Should you wish to review the rulemaking file, you can make an appointment to do so by contacting our regulations coordinator, Anthony Martin, at 916-795-9347. And at this time, I'm going to turn over to uh, turn this over to Kim Malm to provide some information regarding the comments received during the 45-day comment period. Thank Good you. Good morning. Thank you, Miss. Uh, Madam Chairman, members of the Finance and Admin Committee, Kim Malm, CalPERS team member. Today I'm joined uh, by Justin Simpson, CalPERS legal team. This is an action item for final approval to amend the board election regulation 554.7 and submit the final rulemaking package to the Office of Administrative Law. As you're aware, I presented this package at the January board offsite in January of 2018. January, we did this in order to meet the 2018 board election schedule. The board approved the regulation language, moving the placement of the signature, perjury statement, and any other identifying uh, information to the back of the envelope instead of the back of the ballot. This 45-day comment period began on February 9th and ended on March 26th. Two comments were received during this time frame. The first comment was in regards to the signature on the back of the envelope and the uh, concern of identity theft. And after considering this comment, we are not recommending any change as it follows the California and federal election format. The second comment suggested multiple changes, but no change to this proposed regulation. Therefore, no changes will be made. We did confirm with the Office of Administrative Law that the changes suggested in the five-page memo that you received would constitute a substantial change that would require another review cycle. If the committee accepts any of these changes, there's a risk that we won't make the 2018 state school and public agency election. This means that the, the signature and perjury statement will remain on the ballot and not be moved to the back of the envelope. We anticipate updating the board election regulations as soon as this package is approved by the Office of Administrative Law and all of the suggestions submitted will be taken into consideration. As Ms. Taylor stated earlier, interested parties may present testimony. The committee and CalPERS team members are not required to respond to public comment. During this meeting, all comments received will receive a written response from CalPERS as part of the final rulemaking package. If the committee approves this existing package, um, the final regulation will be submitted to Office of Administrative Law and they have 30 working days to review and approve this package. 
We expect to obtain OAL approval and make all the appropriate changes to the ballot and ballot return envelope for the 2018 state school and public agency elections. At this time, Madam Chair, I'm happy to answer any questions. We are. Um, I, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, so if anybody wishes to speak at this time and you have turned in a speaker form, you will be recognized in the order the forms were received. If you have not submitted a form or would prefer not to, you will be given an opportunity to speak just after the last speaker has completed his or her comments. The record of this hearing will close at the completion of the last speaker's presentation. We request that each speaker begin by providing his or her name and affiliation for the record, and you will have three minutes for your presentation. And at this time, I'd like to recognize J.J. Jelensic. Can we make sure the microphone's on? Thank you. Looks like you turned it on for me. Okay. Uh, I'm J.J. Jelensic, a CalPERS member. I'm the one who asked for the hearing. I know how closely the board members read the agenda material and wanted to make sure I was available to answer any questions about my comments. As I pointed out in my comments in January, before the board approved the proposed regulatory changes, and in my written comments on the proposed regulations, this election has many problems. This proposed regulation addresses the most pressing, but clearly not all the problems. For example, one half of the certified vendor is certified to print ballots. None of the parties are certified to run election process. The ballot count is not a physical count. It is the merging of three electronic files. The election results are known. They are the sum of the three files. The fact that the sum is known, but the addends are not, does not lend a lot of credibility. These, process, these are process problems and outside of the regulatory process and under the complete control of staff. Election Code 19205 forbids the transmission of electronic data over external communication networks, including the public phone system or the internet. Yet the adopted regulations require both to be addressed by regulatory changes. The proposed changes eliminates the requirement that the voters sign the ballot and returns to the prior practice of, of signing the envelope the same practice that exists for absentee ballots. However, it leaves in place Regulation 554.8A2 that says a ballot is valid only if signed. Under the regulations, the voter must sign both the ballot and the envelope. I don't believe that's your intention. Signing the ballot violates Election Code 14287. I understand the board has been advised that it is, it is exempt from the regula regulation code. I think this is bad and irresponsible advice. The proposed regulation eliminates 554.7B. This is the section of the regulation that says there is no need to have an election if only one person files. Again, I assume that is not your intention, but that is what the regulation will now say. I encourage you to fix both of these issues before proceeding further. I also hope you come back soon to fix the other problems with the election process. Thank you, and if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Jelensic. At this time, is there any other person who would like to speak on agenda item 6C? Is there anybody else that would like to speak? All right. If there are no speakers, um, then no one wishes to speak. Just giving you one more chance. <laughs> there being no further testimony on this matter, the record of this hearing is now closed and this hearing is adjourned. The time is 9.09 .09 a.m. Do any board members wish to speak on the proposed regulations? I do have. Margaret Brown. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Um, I'd like to uh, thank Mr. Jelensic for his um, comments. I, too, um, share his concerns about the um, changes to the, to the regulations and then the parts that aren't included um, in the regulatory process, which is the fact uh, that the ballots are not counted in public. Um, it was very astonishing for me to see the vendor who receives the ballots in Everett, Washington, that they're opening them daily ahead of the election count, and no one is actually supervising or watching that process. Our regulations clearly say that the ballots would be counted in public, and instead electronic files are being sent to La Jolla, and they are, I guess, tabulating, according to the reports, but there is actually no um, check on this process. Um, Ms. Mom, I heard you say in the beginning that that these regulations comply with both federal and state, um, but and then in some regards you say you're, you're exempt from the the state re that you're exempt for the state regulations. But I want us to be clear. Um, Online voting is not permitted. Ballots need to be counted in public for us to have a secure process and to make sure that it is uh, that it is fair for the participants. Um, uh, I have actually requested the data on the election results by mail or, and by uh, online and by phone, because I also have a problem with the phone system. Uh, and we can't get those numbers. We only can get an aggregate. Um, and so there's a lot of concerns with the process, and I hope we will, in fact, uh, adjust the regulations to um, fix those issues at this point. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Mr. Gillahan. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I would just like to ask staff to speak to the, the section on uh, the public comment related to um, the appearance that our proposed regs are, are not necessarily aligned with our process regarding signing the uh, envelope as opposed to the ballot. Justin Simpson, CalPERS team member. Um, so if I understand the question you're asking, and the public commentator was suggesting there's a conflict between 554.8A2 and our suggested revisions to 554.7A. Uh, we don't believe there is a conflict. Uh, the way that we look at 554.A2 is it, it's actually a very carefully drafted regulation that allows for flexibility. Um, and, and the portion of 554.8 a2 that uh, wasn't explicitly stated in the public comment is it says a, a, a ballot will be invalidated if it is not signed in accordance with CalPERS instructions. And it's that last contingency, that last piece that creates the flexibility for us to um, implement procedures um, and implement instructions on the signature of the perjury statement. And we're doing that here, and we're creating that rule by amending 554.7a. And uh, my understanding is that the instructions that will be submitted along with the ballot materials will also be very clear uh, as to where the ballot uh, must be signed, which in this case will be on the reverse side of the envelope. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Gillahan. Mr. Miller. Yeah. Um, I'm relatively new to the board, but I'm not new to CalPERS elections. <laughs> I first ran in 2001, and from even my first experience running for CalPERS board, I've had concerns that the way we approach interpreting our election regulations, the way we've crafted them with flexibility, it really leaves a lot of room for people to have misunderstandings, for us to kind of change things, uh, sometimes in the middle of an election, in the middle of the game. And so I would suggest that being unambiguous, being explicit, making it very clear that we consider an envelope to be equivalent to a ballot when signing, things like that. Um, the more we can make that clear in our regulations rather than have to rely on trying to do it in instructions might be more helpful in the long run. But my main point is I'm really looking forward to the opportunity in the future to really look at our election processes, look at how we do things, 
look at the challenges and problems we've had in the past and really give it a really good, fresh look because uh, we, you know, we've improved over the years, but there's still improvements to be made. And I'm still perplexed at the low turnouts, despite our best efforts to make it easier and more convenient to vote. Um, you know, the, the issues of privacy and security aside, I think that's an even bigger topic <coughs> that I'm really looking forward to continuing that conversation to try to get to the bottom of that over the, um, in the coming months. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Mr. Koskin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Mullen, for this presentation. I just want to distinguish a couple things. I think a lot of folks are taking uh, that the signature of the envelope is somehow identifies that you may have voted for someone. Actually, all it's doing is very similar as when I go in to vote myself, I just sign. You can't ask for any ID, but it's just the fact that I showed up, there's a blank. So I could mail an envelope that has no vote in it. Just send off the envelope. And, 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 and that in and of itself is a decision that I don't want to vote for anybody. <clears throat> but by signing the back of the envelope, all we're doing is it's very similar to what the current practice is when I walk into a polling booth or a polling station, yep. um, and I say, you know, are you so-and-so, is this your address? Yes, Ch -ch -ch sign. I'm not asking for identifiable information. I guess the, the two questions I have, um, one is, just because it's signed, we're not actually tabulating on the inside if the person voted or not, right? We're just saying that the back of this document has been signed, that, that got correct, because we're not, we're not squaring up. It's correct. Okay. We so, aren't so validating no, signatures. We don't have a signature database. Okay, it's just, I mean, that's, I mean, that's <clears throat> part of it is I can just scratch it through because we're not comparing it to sort of Mr. Miller's question, um, and, and we can disagree on, on some other things, but we're not saying these nine folks didn't vote uh, when the envelope comes in. I mean, we're not comparing those signatures to the, to the voter rolls. Just no. like when I go chase votes in a general election, I can go see who voted and who didn't vote and I can now go chase those votes because they've signed the form or they're listed as an absentee ballot and the registrar crosses those folks off as they come in. And if you're doing an absentee ballot, you're still signing the document. We receive aggregate data from the vendor on um, uh, the information that was in the RFP and in their proposal that basically tells us the things that I provide in your report, which is uh, male, female, age groups, top 20 cities, top 20 employers, um, and and that's uh, that's the information that we receive from the vendor. We don't receive any other detailed information. But that's off the ballot. Mm -hmm. That's not off the envelope. It's correct. Okay. You're correct. That's and so correct. In this case, this is just level one, so that. It's Again, you can, you're can you scratching through because we're not verifying the signature. The, right. the, it just has to have a signature on the back of the envelope Correct. to attest that someone, rather than me gathering up a thousand envelopes yes. and just dropping them in the mail. Yes, sir. Okay. I mean, I just want to make sure because we talk a lot about privacy and others. And I'm just trying to get at it is because it is will be the reverse side of the envelope shall be signed by the voter. So, I mean, when you got to be an eligible voter, but we're not to get one. Mm -hmm. So, but we're not verifying that that signature on the back of the envelopes is the registered voter. We're just That's seeing correct. that it was signed. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Under perjury. Under perjury, yes. Uh, th thank you very much. I just kind of want to add as well, if, you, if anyone gets um, absentee ballots for your regular voting, you have to sign the envelope. That's right. So, I mean, it's a, it's a typical practice. <laughs> And um, if, if I may, that, I'm sorry, that's what I meant earlier, um, Ms. Brown, was that the signature on the back of the envelope follows state and federal um, format, was all I was trying to point out. Right, Thank you. right. Thank you very much. Mr. Fechner. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move staff's recommendation. Second. Second. I have one other uh, person who'd like to speak, and then we will vote. Mr. Jones. Thank you. Thank you, You're Madam right. Chair. Yeah, just... Um, on the ballot, uh, what information is on the ballot that uh, verifies the person that's voting? There is, will no longer be any identifiable information on the ballot. It's on the envelope. The ballot is strictly who you're voting for, okay. and the identifiable information is on the barcode, and your signature is on the envelope, the back of the envelope. Okay, okay thanks. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Having a motion from Mr. Fechner and a second by Mr. Gillahan, all those in favor of the recommended action, say aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. 
All right. Well, you can't vote. Sorry. <laughs> thank, uh, thank you very much. The um, recommendation passes. And we are going to move on our agenda. So let's start with our executive report. Charles. Good Thanks. morning, Madam Chair and committee members. Charles S. Bunton Carper, CFO. Today we have six action items for your consideration. You've already heard the proposed Board of Administration election regulation and public hearing. The second item is the first reading of the fiscal year 18-19 annual budget. And the third is the annual review of board member employer reimbursements. According to government code section 20092, allows for the re reimbursement of elected corporate board member salary and benefits paid based on the board approved percentages. In addition, our IT department will be seeking your approval for the disaster recovery contract extension. The action items will conclude with the actuarial office providing reports on the state and schools valuations and seeking approval for employer employee contributions for state and schools. On the information items today, we have team members will present semi-annual health financial report, providing the committee with an update on the financial studies for the six CAPES PPO plans, two EPO plans, and seven flex-funded HMO plans. You also receive a quarterly update on reporting and participating employers. The update includes the committee's direction to provide a revenue funding source column on the JPS summary report and a status update on the Herod Fire Protection District. You will also hear a presentation on the long-term valuation report, which provides the results of the actual valuation for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2017. The next Finance and Administration Committee is scheduled here in Sacramento for May 15, 2018. Will include a second reading of the 18-19 annual budget, the asset liability transfer to San Bernardino County Employees Retirement System, and an extension of the third party administrative contract for the supplementary income programs. Madam Chair, this concludes my report, and at this time, I would be pleased to take any questions. Seeing no questions, thank you very much. So we'll move on to item three, consent items. Waiting for a motion, thank you. Moved by Mr. Jones, second by Ms. Paquin. Um, all those in favor? Aye. All those um, opposed? All right, consent items, uh, agenda item three, is passed. Consent items four, I had nothing pulled off. So we are moving on to our accounting uh, financial Action. reporting and budget. So that's agenda item five. Yep. Okay. Charles Sussman, Carpus CFO. The Carpus fiscal year 18, 19 annual budget pro proposal is being presented today as a first reading. As stated by our CEO, Marcy Frost, on the first page of last year's CAFR, and I quote, we have a clear plan forward to ensure long-term sustainability of the fund and to increase our funded status, but it will take time. Our plan is to raise, our plan to raise the funded status is built on three strategies. One, addressing financial challenges. Two, operating our organization as efficiently as possible to contain costs. And three, and following sound investment principles. This presentation today is exactly about that. As any of you know, uh, and as any CFO knows, to create value, you have to have discipline and consistency. And that's what we mean to display here today. The mission of our organization still remains intact deliver retirement and health care benefits to members and their beneficiaries. And I should say it remains sacrosanct. We believe in that, and that's why we're here. I know, Madam Chair and members, you are familiar with the strategic goals. But for the sake of those for whom this is not familiar, we have it here on the next slide. I will move on to the key areas of the focus of the budget on the next slide. And that is innovative approaches to improve benefit services and continuing customer service, effective information technology solutions, cost efficiencies, and workload capacity, 
efficient risk and risk management and compliance, and sound management practice and leadership development. On the next slide, I have for you the, uh, the highlights of the budget. You will see a reduction in investment external management fees of 10.5 million. Uh, this team is working together, all of us together, to find opportunities uh, to, to contain costs and to reduce complexity. And you probably heard and you hear it away again that the team will certainly pay for alpha performance, but not beta performance. Um, we w you will see also a reduction of 3.5 million on the discretionary costs. And this reduction supports our strategic measure to reduce total overhead costs by 1.5 to 2% annually. No new positions are proposed. Resource needs are addressed through position pooling. My corporate business optimization project scheduled for completion for fiscal year 17-18. Maintenance and operating costs will move to operating budget as we will see in a minute. Replacement of the current human resource management system with a modern cloud-based system to meet business needs and requirements. And transitioning of the contract center platform to a cloud-based platform to reduce complexity of the current multi-vendor contract center application. <laughs> On the next slide, we have the actual budget, which I refer to as the, the price tag or the ask for today. The proposed fiscal year 18-19 corpus to the budget is about approximately 1.7 billion, represents an overall increase of about 4.8 million. It's only 0.3% from fiscal year 17-18 approved budget, also around 1.7 billion. Bear in mind that at 0.3%, this is less than current rate of inflation, which CPIU is at about 2.1%. Moving back to the top of the chart, and the salary and benefits, you can see that this went up 6%, which is mostly attributed to general salary increase, GSI of 4% this year, and the additional 4% for fiscal year 18-19. As I mentioned earlier, we have decreased discretionary spending, and discretionary, I mean uh, temporary help, things that we have direct control over, travel, training, and the like. The reduction, as you can see there, is at, at, at about 3.5%. Um, if, you, if you move to the right, the, to the right side of, of the, the chart, you see uh, budget to forecast, there's also a reduction of 0.8%. Uh, so really, when you look at it in total for the two years, there's about approximately a 4% reduction, a 38 uh, from fiscal year 17-18 to the proposed budget of 18-19. The items on the list, the baseline formal budget request includes costs associated with my carpets maintenance and operations and the IT hardware refresh, totaling uh, just over 8.2 million. Also, we just wanted to point out the ongoing admin FBRs, uh, the actual, it includes the actual first principle, the actual first principle model, state schools and public agency elections, human resource management solutions, accessibility compliance, and core technology and cloud mobility. As mentioned earlier, we have made significant improvements to our investment external, investment external management fees with a reduction of 10.5 million on that list, as you can see. Given that we are currently in rate negotiations, Third-party administrative fees will be updated in the second reading of the budget. Enterprise projects costs have in decreased by 13 million, 58 percent. This is attributed to the My Corporate Business Optimization Project moving to maintenance and operations as it is reflected in the operating budget. Costs this year associated with the actual evaluation system redesign, human resource manage management solutions, information technology solutions, and a contract center applications migration to the cloud. Lastly, as you can see, the headquarters building costs have gone down 2.6 million, nearly 10%. This is due to reductions in furniture and fixtures, owner improvements, operation costs from the recent sale of the Thompson Dix and Raymond's buildings and revenue rent. Finally, the budget includes no change in authorized positions, which remains at 2,875. 
To conclude, Madam Chair, this proposed budget includes the resource requirements to continue to support sound operational governance, aligns the budget to strategic and business planning while delivering on realistic cost containment, expands the use of technology, and most importantly, focusing on the customers, members. Today, I'm asking for a recommendation to approve the fiscal year 18-19 annual budget proposal as first reading in the amount of one billion six hundred and eighty million six hundred and thirty six thousand with two thousand eight hundred and seventy five positions. Madam Chair, I also recommend approval of the transmitter of this agenda item to the Joint Legislative Budget Committee, Fiscal Committees of the Legislature, State Controller, and Department of Finance in accordance with the Budget Act of 2017, and to the Legislative Analyst Office, Government Operations Agency, and the Office of Legislative Counsel. Thank you, Madam Chair, and at this time, I'm pleased to take any questions. So thank you very much. That was a very clear concise reading of the budget. Um, one of my other hats I wear, I do this as well, but it uh, was very understandable. Um, I want to thank you very much, Mr. Osbutin. Um, I do have a couple, of a couple of folks that want to talk. I want to ask you some questions, Ms. Brown. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm looking at page seven of nine on the slide deck, the total proposed budget, and I just wanted to ask a few questions since I'm, this is my first time seeing the budget. Um, the investment operating costs are going up by $2.185 million, and there's a footnote that says uh, that these costs are separate from administrative I mean, they're separate from CalPERS administrative operating costs. So can you tell me what the investment operating costs uh, entail and, and why it's going up? I mean, it looks like we're, we're cutting in other areas and why the investment operating costs are going up. Uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, let me take a crack at it and okay. we'll hand it over to Matt as well. If needed. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Matt Flynn, CalPERS team member. Um, the principal reason for the increase that you're seeing on this presentation is our contract with our master custodian. Um, we had enjoyed a number of years of uh, reduced fees as a result of a litigation we had with them, and those fees have sunsetted. So in essence, we're returning to our original baseline um, contract rate with uh, State Street for Custody Services. And that's responsible for the entire uh, difference you see here. Um, thank you. Uh, and then um, enterprise, so you're good. Enterprise project costs, uh, reduction of 57.8%. What are enterprise project costs? I just, I don't know what those are. Uh, of course, uh, project costs, uh, Member Brown, as you know, pro projects are the things that extend beyond one operating cycle. So these are things that, projects that we put in place to benefit several periods of the reporting periods. If it's not clear, let me, let me state that again. No more, no more expenditure, no more spending happens in the period that you're reporting on. Mm. And then project, expenditure projects, enterprise projects, for the most part, extend beyond one uh, reporting cycle. And then in, in this case, like the prior year, for example, we had items uh, for the My Carpers, which was a number, of, a very large number, and now all of that is being scaled down. And as I mentioned, uh, My Carpers project completes <laughs> this uh, fiscal year. So as we go into 1819, uh, there's only a, a small amount which becomes a normal operating budget. Is there anything else besides my CalPERS? Yes, that? there were several items in there. But those are all basically winding down? Correct. Okay, perfect. And then um, I'm going to ask actually for the, a copy of the full budget. I, I love you that stuff, so the detail, that'd be great. We always get one. We do? Yeah. Great, thank you. All right, Mr. Gillahan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first, I'd like to, to thank this team uh, for holding position authority flat. It's a refreshing change, and it's something that uh, some of us have been, a drum we've been beating for years, so uh, I, I appreciate the change in approach and, and holding our position authority flat. Uh, also, thank you for the presentation. I just had, uh, Charles, I'd like a little more clarification on the, the reduction in headquarters building costs. I didn't quite understand that piece. <coughs> 
the uh, let me let me ask him to speak to her about I, I do have Kim good morning Kim mom Calpers team member you know, I can only prepare for one agenda item at a, at a time. Um, so, Mr. Gillahan, we reduced um, in an effort from uh, Ms. Frost's conversation with us last year and this year in regards to 68% funded. Um, we have taken, removed everything out of the headquarters budget for this fiscal year that is not a health and safety item. And so there's no carpet replacement, there's no paint replacement, um, any of the things that we would do to um, keep the building um, pristine is not necessary. Um, health and safety items are necessary when you are in a, uh, a fiscal uh, environment that we're in. Uh, and I thought I heard Charles say something about selling some property or something. Was did there, there is um, the the overall. Uh, cost savings were 3.2. There was a spending of 0.6, which brings it to a budget reduction of 2.6. And in the budget reduction, as uh, Ms. Mom was talking about, there, re there is a reduction in maintenance costs. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's because if you let properties go, then the overall maintenance goes down. I think that's what I was referring to, that because we don't have as many properties as we had before, the selling of the properties have led to the reduction in the operating costs. And we're not deferring any maintenance that's gonna come back and bite us in the future? We are not deferring any necessary maintenance for um, health and safety or, or for items that are necessary to be done for this year. Yeah, yeah I'm talking like building and take structural yeah. integrity yes. stuff. Uh, window washing, things that are, uh, that we can uh, live without um, for at least another year. And, and, and thank you, Charles. Yeah, we also um, transferred the T. Diggs building and the uh, Ramos, or not Ramos, T. Diggs and the 500 uh, R Street parking lot, 1801 Third Street, to the investment office. And so that came out of my portfolio as well, and that's also a reduction because of the maintenance that was uh, that I had in my budget to maintain those properties. The, the, those, those costs, I assume, shifted to the investment office budget? And the uh, it, well, it's in an LLC. Yeah. It's in an LLC as an investment oh, property. Oh, as an investment, okay, yeah. all right, I got you. All right, yeah. thank you. All right. Mr. Jones. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first of all, I'd like to congratulate you on again getting the Distinguished uh, uh, Award from the Government Finance Officers Association. Congratulations. And also um, to um, indicate the, uh, applaud you on the continued improvement in, in the presentation of data where you've added your, um, over the last several years, uh, you've added the forecasted uh, budget uh, so you can look at budget to budget, you can look at actions to budget, you can look at forecast to budget. So that answers a lot of questions and now we don't have to ask because the data is very well, very well presented. And then uh, congratulations to uh, the investment office for continuation of the external management fees being reduced by $10.5 million. And that was a goal that we had is to continue to reduce those costs. And, and I applaud you for that. And I do have a couple of questions. On um, page 10 of 39 of uh, the presentation, and this, let me see, it's, what page is it from the board book? Uh, 92 of 306. Mr. Jones, um, it's page 10, you said? Uh, it's page 10, 10 of 39, 39. from yeah. okay. the hard copy, I one. guess, but the board book is page 92. I, I just, I, I don't remember, I'm, I was trying to remember what was the reason for that sharp decrease uh, from the uh, actuals to actuals in uh, the years 15, 16 to 16, 17. <laughs> it's interesting you would ask that. Uh, when I saw that over the weekend, I sent out a message asking for the same question. Let me follow up and okay. come back to you on that one. Okay, okay, good. Okay, then the next uh, question is, on page of your document 22 or 39 
and uh, it's 104 of the iPad. And the uh, footnote two, it says profit sharing for private equity is deducted from the net returns. And I thought profit sharing was deducted from gross returns. Good morning again, Matt Flynn, CalPERS team member. Uh, private equity returns, as you've seen, are, um, yes, deducted from net returns that we receive um, from the partnership and are disclosed in the CAFR. Um, because they're the volatility and the inaccuracy of trying to project those into the, um, to the budget, we don't include them in the presentation you're looking at here. What's, what's here are the management fees only, not the profit sharing. We do, however, as you know, disclose profit sharing at year end right. in full detail, as well as in the AB uh, 2833 report in December. Okay, thank you. Okay, right. thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Ms. Paquin? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Asamanta. It's a great presentation. really appreciate it. And I did have one additional question on page 22, which is investment related. And it says here that the total external management performance fees are decreasing by 20 million and then the base fees are increasing by about 10 million. And I was just curious um, why the external performance fees would be projected to be decreasing. Increasing. Thank you again, Matt okay. Flynn, CalPERS team member. Um, what you're seeing here is the principal um, reason for the um, deduction that you see is in the real assets um, portfolio. And the real assets portfolio has a prior period um, um, accrual that's just being recognized here. So the actual dollars that were, um, um, th that the portfolio is spinning off are about the same, but because we use accrual accounting, we've already accrued for those um, performance fees in a prior period. So what you're seeing here is the net effect of the accrual plus the actuals that are gonna go out. So it's a little bit of an optics um, as a point in time, it looks like it. Over time, the actuals all are pretty consistent with for real assets. Okay, great, thank you. All right, Mr. Costigan. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Charles, again, great work on getting the budget out and appreciate the continued transparency. Uh, just a couple points, one vacancy, or the blanket positions, again, congratulations, you and I had talked, the fact we're almost done with those. I'm glad to see the bigger question I have, although I'll agree with Mr. Gillahan, I appreciate you capping PYs, but I note we do have uh, savings. So what I don't see in the budget is what's our current vacancy rate. So we, we go to the positions authorized. I think you're doing it. You have an offset in cost and uh, you that you put as vacancy savings. So what's the current vacancy rate, generic vacancy rate across the organization, and which unit has the largest vacancy rate? Current you got to turn on your, your mic. Your mic isn't on. Sorry. The, the current vacancy rate is about 6.5%. And that's across the whole organization. And then who has the largest vacancy rate? Um, in, in terms of the, the largest, I believe is in the investment office. I can double check this for you. No, it, it's generally is in vote and they run close to 10%. Because what I'm trying to get at is we've seen, a, we've seen an increase in overall cost, you know, 199 to, oops, to 208, and yeah, just it disappeared. Um, and then you offset that with 18 in vacancy. So, I mean, we're, and this has just been a pet peeve of mine for years, nothing new here, is that um, one, the blankets are about transparency and we're moving them back in. We still sort of maintain artificially high vacancy rates. I think the discussion we were having, it used to be that finance had a position, position was vacant six months and it went away. That's no longer the case. And I just wanna make sure that folks are aware we are watching. I mean, the, I want the positions filled, that's the reason. We've talked with the chief actuary about some of the positions in there as well. And so, again, scrutiny and asking for, so I'm glad to see we cap PYs. The problem is we're still running vacancies. Um, and we may go back and revisit PYs that were asked for last year and where are we? Because what I don't want to see built into the budget are increased positions to say, well, we're capping headcount, but what we're doing, and, and I, again, appreciate from a transparency standpoint, you capture that in the budget item. So it, it's there. So anyway, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, what I can say to Member uh, Costigan is 
This is the first reading. We will certainly take all of this back and look at the numbers. I also, I should point out some of the numbers you see here. I certainly, as the years, as the months go by, we're certainly going to take a good look at them. And and at the second reading, at the mid-year reading, uh, we'll be giving you finer numbers than what you have here. So it's an, it's a continuous improvement process. And we appreciate that. So um, this is an action item. Move staff recommendation. Henry, I don't. Second. Oh, you are on. I'm sorry. I didn't even <laughs> click on it. <laughs> oh, it happened to me yesterday, so I don't know. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Somebody said they were. No, I, back to uh, following up on Richard's uh, comment about the vacancy. Uh, several years ago, we uh, suggested and, and it was complied with that uh, we would start recognizing the vacancy rate in the budget development process so that it's money that we know is not going to be spent. So therefore, you need fewer dollars in terms of the adopted budget. So my question is, that 6% uh, rate, what does that correspond to in dollars that have been reduced in this budget? Mm -hmm. Doug Hoffner, CalPERS team member. So we actually have a 4% assumed vacancy rate okay. within this, to your point. Um, that would give us about a 2.5% um, difference to Mr. Costigan's point about the 6.5%. So I haven't done the math on that. but. That is built into the assumptions we have before you today. Okay, that's, that's good enough. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right. So again, I'd like to entertain a motion to pass the staff's recommendation. So moved by Mr. Gillahan, second by Mr. Jones. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. All right, let's move on to thank you. 6A. This is uh, annual review of board member employee, employer reimbursements. Yes. And go ahead, Charles. And Madam Chair, uh, Charles S. Bunton, Carpecia, for what I have here, it's really to give you the rundown. Can um, you um, talk into the mic? Sorry. Oh, yeah, it's to give you the rundown of members and percentages and proposed percentages uh, for the fiscal year. Uh, if we go to the next page, you will see that Member Brown, his proposed percentage of time is 82%, effective February 14, 2018. And the, the duties, uh, as you can see in the second column, are all laid out for, uh, for you. Uh, we go down to the next one, which is Member Freckner at 93%, beginning February 13. Uh, moving on to the next page uh, is the President Martyr. And as you can see, she's at 100% now at beginning at January 16, 2018. Uh, Member Miller at 61%. And last but not the least, Member Chairman, Chairwoman <laughs> Teresa, <laughs> Teresa Taylor at 72%. So this is what I, the, the, like I said, is a rundown and a compilation of members' proposed time, and we certainly have taken a look at it, and this all complies with the law. So I would uh, recommend approval for board member percentage of time to be spent on board-related duties based on board and committee selections held in January, February, and March this year. All right, thank you. So I just want to comment on my own t previous time um, uh, that's in the agenda item is before I took on current um, responsibilities that I have, so that's why it reflects lower than it probably normally would. Um, but other than that, I would like to entertain a motion. I have some questions. Oh, there you are. I didn't look. Mr. Costigan. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a few things. What's our base number of hours are we using for the calculations? Is it 1,820? Is it a 35-hour work week? Uh, it's, uh, the hour is uh, 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 1,260. Mm -hmm. Those are the baseline hours. No, I'm sorry. In order to get to the percentage. Yes. Okay. 100%, uh, 61%. Uh, uh, that's a percentage of something. 1,260 uh, is represents, theoretically, Oh, I see you. Board member. So what I'm getting at is, is it 1,820? How many hours? 2080. So we're using a 40-hour work week, not yes. a 35-hour work week. Okay. So uh, just a couple questions in reading the code section. I just want to make sure we're, everything's done properly. Um, the statute says when the member is on leave. What I don't see, is there is there a leave document or is there paperwork 
Uh, that c can also be attached showing that the elected <coughs> members were on leave from their appointing agency. Do we have that documentation? Mm -hmm. At this point, we do not, but we certainly can, can get that. Uh, but Perhaps. if I may, the, the no, just it's transparency. Yeah. I mean, it should just be part of the, it should be part of the presentation. I'm just reading the statute. Right, but but if I may, um, the the 2080 is certainly the full time work for pretty much almost anybody in any entity. So, if if the member is allowed at that rate, it certainly includes the vacation time too as well. And I guess that will be between them and the employer. I know, that's what. So, so, I mean, I'm just trying, because the numbers just don't, Mr. Miller's at 61%, Ms. Brown's at 82%. So, so when you look at these, and I know that this is just folks, so right now you have two members, for example, so I'm just trying to calculate. I actually think, maybe Mr. Gillahan, you can help me out here. I, I don't, I know, he's shocking. Uh, <laughs> the state of California is not a 40 hour. It's actually a lower work week, is that correct? No, we're 40 hours. It, it's, yeah. it's four, but it, it thought it was 18. We're 176 hours. There you go. Yeah. 176 times. Well, well, I'm sorry. just trying to get at you have well, 176 times 12 is 2,232, which is not 24. Yeah, there's an average in there somewhere. I understand. Yeah, my mic is on actually. No, I know, but. Yeah, I understand. I'm just trying to get at what we're having right now is we have two members whose numbers don't ma match up who are actually the same currently in their positions on the board. And I want this document to be accurate. So we have one who's reporting, right or wrong, I'm not saying anything, is the proposed percentage for Ms. Brown is 82%, the proposed for Mr. Miller is 61%, okay? What's our baseline that we're starting at? Because either you're getting shorted, you're either going to work 39% of the time, or, or you're not. It's and you're going 18% of the time, or you're not. And, I'm, and we're being asked on an action item, and I want the information to be correct. So I just want an answer. Yeah, and, and the answer is this. Um, there are differences of member activities. As in the case of uh, Ms. Brown, for example, there are other activities that she's engaged in, which is outside of uh, the baseline uh, items that are prescribed. And for example, speaking engagements of 60 hours, and I'm just giving you one. Whereas in Mr. Miller's case, there isn't none, there isn't any. So therefore, when you look at them, that creates a difference between the two. And, and, those, and that, that documentation is being submitted? Yes, we have it okay. here. So that, I mean, that, that, that explains, is that Ms. Miller, or Ms. Brown, is actually engaging in more activities, and Mr. Miller is not putting it. Now, also, this document is required to be done quarterly. The reimbursements are done on, on quarterly. So while we may be adopting a percentage on the time, the reimbursements occur on a quarterly basis when they're submitted. Correct. And then you verify that the, I mean, in addition to the, the, the baseline time of 105 hours a month, um, any additional time, such as the additional uh, time that Ms. Brown is doing in giving, uh, right. meeting with constituent groups. And if Mr. Miller ends up meeting with constituent groups, you would bring this back to us if the percentage goes up, or how would this get approved if he, if Mr. Miller went to 82%? We will, um, we will bring it back to this committee. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sure. Mr. Miller. Yeah, um, I think part of the, the challenge I've been having is my employer has been um, not very enlightened on this whole process. Um, myself, um, uh, my employee association that I was affiliated with, CalPERS staff have all been doing a phenomenally good job of trying to reduce some of the, the administrative challenges I've faced. As a result, um, it's been very difficult for me at times just to keep up with even just all the volume of information and material that I need to review and research and look at. So I've had very little opportunity, as much as I would like to do it, to be out engaging with constituent groups and everything, understanding that the limitation of the baseline was 61%, and I was doing my darndest to live within that and try to deal with my issues with my employer, which to some extent may be a residual of being a union official for 30 years. Um, but going forward, um, 
and I'm, I think I can live within that for another quarter, but there's a lot of opportunities I've missed out on to, to engage and to do activities beyond just the basic dealing with the learning curve and preparing for these meetings. So um, I'm not sure how that process works because it's a chicken and egg thing. Um, my employer is still fighting about who's responsible for my time and um, if I go one hour over they're docking me and all this stuff. So it's hard for me to demonstrate a need beyond the 61% when I am trying desperately not to go beyond the 61% um, because they're threatening to dock my time if I do at, at my employer. And so it's, it's kind of a catch-22 for me at this point. If I had um, you know, gone out and done a lot of an engagement, if I did any of it during normal business hours or anything that would put me over 40 hours in a week on my timesheet, there would be a major challenge with my employer who has only just in the last few days even executed the MOU with CalPERS to, for reimbursement and is now questioning the whole invoicing process and wanting to go back and redo everything. So um, I'm just hoping that uh, we can have continuing patience from CalPERS staff and continuing assistance to try to get this sorted out and uh, perhaps um, I'll be asking the board's indulgence for a, a higher percentage when we revisit this next quarter. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Mr. Jones? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Since we uh, focusing on some ask, uh, <laughs> uh, you uh, have uh, Ms. Hollinger, Mr. Slayton, Mr. Rubicover, and myself uh, on a monthly basis, take home is about $265. And I would like to see what the possibilities are seeking legislation to modify that. I'm not suggesting a fixed amount. Uh, I think whatever can be done would be helpful. So I just think that, and, and I know many of us probably spend 70% of our time uh, and for 200 and take home $260 a month. So I just think it needs to be addressed. All right. So. I'd like to um, suggest that, Mr. Osmond, yeah. just that we can look into it. I don't know what, Matt, if that's even possible, but it is a request from one of the members. I don't know what the legislation is. So. Yeah, Chair Taylor, uh, we did look at this a year or two ago, and it would require legislation because the statutes are quite clear with respect to how much the appointed members uh, uh, get compensated. So that's the answer as far as whether you could do it otherwise. You can't have to go to legislation. We'd have to go to legislation. Can we uh, make, make a recommendation that we at least explore that for, for our members that are appointed? Because this is a lot of work, and those of us that are elected do get reimbursed. So I, I, I do think that might be a fair option. But um, moving on, I have lots of people who want to talk, uh, but nobody on the committee. So Ms. Brown. Thank you. Um, Mr. Miller, I'm sorry for your troubles. Um, you and I technically hold the same type of position representing all members, uh, but my employer has been very supportive. Uh, they were concerned about the MOU format and how and when they would be reimbursed and does it really work this way. Um, but, but they have been very supportive. Um, and so when I did the calculation, um, uh, it, and it is an estimate of hours, it looks like I'll be spending um, 30 to 40 hours uh, per month, basically uh, meeting with constituents and giving presentations. And just so you know, I regularly accept invitations from Retired Public Employees Association, the California State Retirees, 
Uh, any other um, associations or unions that ask for a meeting, I meet with county and city employers, uh, county boards of education, uh, even the League of Cities uh, asked me to come and meet with them. And I uh, took that meeting and had a great conversation about how they shouldn't cut the COLA for retirees. Um, and I also do share um, CalPERS Good Works when um, CalPERS recently came out with sort of how the fund is doing better. Ms. Frost was able to quickly put that into a PowerPoint because I had two presentations last week. And, and so I, I want to let you know that because my employer is supportive, I am able to do the things. Remember, we represent all members. I am able to do the things that, Mr. Miller, you are not. And that's a very unfortunate so I will make sure I say I represent you as well but um, but again the 82 percent is an estimate and so I don't automatically suspect that I will be reimbursed at 82 percent on any given month because I track my hours uh, very closely and will submit those for reimbursement so I hope I've got this right um, but that's what I'm actually doing with my time thank you Ms. yeah I there you go. Oh, 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 thank you. I just uh, wanted to um, support uh, Mr. Jones' recommendation because there's a vast disparity between um, some of the members when we're doing the same amount of work, but there's just a gross disparity in compensation. So um, I would hope that we would pursue that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hollinger. Mr. Slayton. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a couple of issues. Uh, one is I don't recall uh, this item ever coming back more than once a year. Uh, am I am I wrong? I I just don't recall it. I think it's an annual effort, but maybe it does come back on a quarterly basis. Wh which is it? On the document that I have, it says annual. Um, that's okay. Yeah. That's what I thought. And and when I read the words in the cover memo. Reimbursement to the elected board members' employers processed on a quarterly basis based on the approved percentage of time. So if we approve this once a year, um, uh, Ms. Brown's employer uh, reimbursement is 82, uh, unless it comes back to this committee to be reviewed uh, and the board. And for Mr. Miller, it's 61% until it is an agenda item to the committee, if I'm understanding it correctly, and the typical is a year. Right. So that's correct. Okay. So uh, there, there's a and couple. It's of up to. I just want to make sure. So she put 82 percent, but it's up to 82 percent or that's 81. Not, that's not what it said. That's not what the words say. So which is it? I, I think it means to say up to. That is that's the ceiling, if you will. So you're saying that the actual time reports that go in actually produce the calculation for the amount of time reimbursed. Correct. So if they turn in hours of 74%, even though it's 82, you the only reimbursement is 74. Yeah. Correct. Okay, very good. Now I, I understand that. Um, I, I do think that in these individual calculations that people make, um, there's some disparity in the maximum that is confusing. So for uh, Ms. Brown, 82%, Mr. Miller, 61 They have the same responsibility on this board and the same uh, participation in terms of being committee members but not chairs or vice chairs. So it, to me, it's, it's strange that the maximum would be different for the two of them. And then for Ms. Brown, uh, her number is higher than Ms. Taylor, who has uh, chairmanship responsibilities. Uh, and vice chair responsibilities. So I don't, again, they don't seem to line up with what the job responsibilities are on the board. And then lastly, I would comment, since everybody else who's in the same position, uh, two of the four have commented, I'll comment as well. Um, you know, we all took this position with the, under, with the clear knowledge of what the compensation uh, would be. Uh, it is nominal, this is effectively a volunteer job. Um, uh, sometimes I take a flight personally to fly in for a meeting and spend $600 to get $300 back. So, you know, the math doesn't really work very well. I, I think, though, there is a, 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 we all have the same fiduciary responsibility. Okay. We have the same responsibility in terms of reading the materials. I have, my constituency are 1,578 employers. 
Uh, for Mr. Jones, he has the entire retiree, retiree. base. Uh, and it's just, uh, it's patently so disparate in terms of the way it's uh, organized in compensation, it doesn't make any sense. So I would encourage something to be done to put it in balance. But I'd also like to see uh, some coherence in terms of what the maximum numbers are for the various, given the positions that people hold on this board. Thank you. So, and before I call on someone else, I just want to comment. As I, I think I proposed last year, 60 some odd percent, but as my duties for my, my actual job prevailed over CalPERS duties, I was not able to fulfill that percentage, which is how you end up on page, whatever this is, page two of three with the amount of reimbursement that I got. So it, it these are estimates. Um, I understand if Ms. Brown is already going out and having uh, speaking engagements where Mr. Miller is not because they're having trouble, you know, with his, his time off. Uh, so, and the same goes with me, whether or not I'm going out and speaking engagements. So it's an estimate based on what you think you're going to be doing and then at the end of the year, it's up to that amount. So if you, over, if you overshoot it, guess what? You have to post your own time. <laughs> So, go ahead, Mr. Slayton. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were still on. So, it, it, in, in some ways, it's a fiction because it's really the actual. It's like hours. a budget. You're kind of doing a budget. It's like a budget. So, yeah. the question is <laughs> why do we create these limits? For what purpose are we doing this? Why isn't it 100 for all of them? Because you're going to turn in actual hours. And that's what it's going to be. So why, why do we have this fictional cap um, sitting out there? I, I just don't quite understand why we go through the exercise. Mr. Asbutton, I don't know if you want to try to answer that. Right, and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn. I think in this case, I would, I would advise that uh, we sit down with the general counsel and look and see what the statute says and what is allowable and what's not allowable. I'm going to call on Mr. Costigan because he has it oh, no. up right now. Oh, no, that was... Um, I, I was just going to say one thing. Mr. Miller, I, I think one of the, the difficulties you may be having is the way the statute is, the election of the board doesn't authorize or require your employer to give you time off. What the statute actually says is upon your election, during which the elected board member is on leave, it's the on leave that triggers the reimbursement, not the election to the CalPERS board because you're a state agent, uh, that you, you're a state employee. So that's the test. So there's nothing that at least, which then again begs the question, is that sort of cleanup from the standpoint as if one of you that are elected from a local or state agency, is the election the triggering event or is the triggering event the on lead? Because in their 2002, uh, two the reimbursement for replacement of members, it's clear it's the is on leave is the triggering mechanism. So that may be why you're having difficulty with your employer right now. So I'm going to go to folks that have not yet spoken on this matter. Um, Mr. Gallagher, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. So this, this uh, discussion has been very enlightening. I, I never fully understood how this process worked, and I understand it uh, quite a bit better. So I want to thank Mr. Costigan for kicking it off. And in, in, light with, uh, in line with Mr. Slayton's comments, I, I think um, I'm not sure 100% is the right formula for everybody. I certainly think the board president should be 100%, uh, and perhaps the vice president and the investment chair, while well, the uh, currently doesn't apply. But I mean, but but but, but <laughs> that could change in the future. But, um, uh, I guess my point is, I, I think there should be, given that the it's a it's an up to amount. I think, and we don't have to do it today, but I think we should have staff come back with a proposal that that has a consistent cap for uh, the remaining elected board members that aren't the board president that don't hold the board president and perhaps vice president slot so I just put that okay. forward as a recommendation for the chair's consideration all right so um, so what you're asking mr. Gillahan is a proposal for a consistent cap for uh, and what the definitions of whether they're a chair of a committee and that kind of thing oh did I turn you off again I, I <laughs> Something I'm sure you I all wish I would do a little more I just want to clarify before I ask Mr. Osborne. Um, what I was going to say, what, what, the point I was making is I, I think there should be a, a consistent cap uh, at, at, a, at a higher threshold given that it's an up to amount so that there's a sort of fairness amongst uh, our elected board members and then uh, a higher cap for whatever the appropriate position, certainly the board president, uh, as I said, should be at 100% and perhaps some of the other senior leadership positions. But I would 
be open to whatever the uh, recommendation would be on that. Okay, Mr. Esbuton, if I'm incorrect here, let me know, but I thought we have a cap that you guys propose to us when we sign our paperwork, and, um, especially if you're a chairperson. Like, we have the normal, this is how many hours is your base. Right. And then if you're a chairperson, vice chair, is that correct? It, you are correct. But in addition to that, there are other things like member meetings and so on, which are written into, to make up to the 2080. Uh, the, the What is laid out does not add up to the 2080. So there's room, there's flexibility for members to elect uh, what other activities that they do on behalf of, of us or on behalf of the board. So, yeah. so essentially we do have kind of caps set and then they can elect to go a little bit higher if they need to. Correct. Based on their response or their activities. other activities. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Miller. Yeah, thank you. And I, and I appreciate Richard's comments. Um, I guess I still have more to learn about how this actually works. And, and likewise with my employer, I would much prefer to have the flexibility to not worry about going over those amounts and have them be additional out of pocket hits or uh, be docked or be disciplined by my, my employer. Um, remembering that this is the same employer that uh, thought that the request to release me for collective bargaining was a request they could say no to because a first line supervisor wanted to have me at a staff meeting. Um, and so it's the same kind of situation. They feel this is leave that my first line supervisor should have discretion over whether to let me go or not. And it's a big kerfuffle. So, um, Mr. Miller, I'm sorry. It's kind of that's off the subject? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I think increasing or, or having a, uh, more flexibility that I could work within, I've been able to keep it under the 61% pretty easily, but that's been at the expense of not really being able to get out and engage with my constituents or take speaking engagements or do any of that broader work that I would like to be doing that this has really constrained me from. I don't necessarily uh, think that I would get to, you know, 80% or more, but but something beyond the 61% to have that flexibility would uh, would be nice. All right, thank you, Mr. Fechner. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to point out to the membership and remind the board members that even though you may be a constitutional position while you're here, you may be an appointee or an electee, but once you're here, all th 13 members represent everyone in the system. Right. Not by section. Right. Um, Mr. Slayton. So just one clarifying, since we're digging into the details, is make sure we all are on the same page of understanding. So let's suppose I'm an elected member, so I'm subject to this policy, and I'm calculating my hours. So let's say I'm going to a conference next Thursday. I'm going to leave Wednesday night. I'm going to attend the conference during the business day. And because it's far away, I'm going to stay overnight one more night and come back. What hours do I report? Do I report just the day hours the, during the work day? Or do I report all of that travel time, the time on the airplane, the time in the hotel, eight et cetera? Hour days. Is it it's just the eight hours max per day? Is that how it's reported? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that true? So I'll have to look. Get a I have to have to look into, okay. into that. That's beyond my pay grade right now. Oh, okay. Well, I understand from the chair that it's. Well, I'm going to say that I wouldn't report the evening hours. Well, I just want to understand hours. what the rule is. Yeah. What's reported? Well, you're the one who receives the report, correct? Yes. Okay. And and for the most part, they just give us the hours. They don't uh, explain w what part of it was for travel or what part of it was for attending the meetings. So, right. do we have rules or do we not have rules on that? I don't think that's in. Well, I'm just saying I could, if I'm traveling for a conference, I could turn in 80 hours for going to a two-day conference. Let me let me commit to this. Let me when I come back next time with a proposal, I will clarify these things for you, Mr. Slayton. Well, for the well, that would be for a, the group. A year from now. <laughs> well, yeah, that's. I, I'm just. Uh, I, I just suggest to the committee that maybe um, you may want to review this next time the committee meets go through it, uh, maybe come up with, approve these. I would suggest the committee approve these until the next meeting, come back to the next meeting with maybe a guideline that's a 190-80, 
that's a very simple approach that so we don't have to go through all the gyrations but then i do think it's important for us because this is this is money the system's money that's paying for this uh, that we make sure that it in fact is the daytime you know part of the 2080 that's coming out and not nights and weekends and travel time unless that travel time is during the business day i just want to make sure that we are yeah. uniform and that we're following a, a good business practices so what i'm hearing is that they um if you could come back at the next finance administration <laughs> committee meeting and just define what the reported hours are supposed to be okay i made an assumption of what they're supposed to be i would never report overnight but i mean it's an eight hour work day that's what i report to my work um in any event, yes, if you could do that. I have a couple more speakers and then we'll uh, take the recommended action, or we'll take action, I'm sorry. Ms. Mother. Yeah, no, I was just gonna suggest that this, I think what would be the most prudent course of action is to review the current process, bring back an agenda item at a future date. I'm not sure next meeting is, that might be too quick. We might need a little bit more time to put something together and to sort of close discussion on this at this time and call for the question. I'm not on the committee, but that would be my recommendation. So, and, and that's fine if you can't, if Mr. Esboden, if you don't feel like you can get this back to us at this, this next meeting, that's fine. Um, but I, I'm gonna go ahead and close discussion. I think everybody's had a chance to have, you have one more question? Okay, I have one more question and then we'll go ahead and call the question. Thank Ms. you, Brown. Madam Chair. J just a point for Mr. Miller. Um, uh, you might want to uh, change your percentage right now to 80% if, since it's an up to you and see if the committee would approve that. So you have the flexibility if you work it out with your employer to take the time you need to do the job. Thank you. That would take an amendment to the motion. There hasn't been a motion, but right now um, I need um, a motion on the action. Microphone, hold on. Sorry, Henry. I thought you were on. Okay, I clicked it. It didn't work. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Something's gone wrong. Yeah. I would move the uh, approval of this uh, with the proviso that uh, Mr. Miller's time be raised to up to 80 percent. All right. Any um, second? I'll second it. Okay. Second. Motion made by Mr. Jones. Seconded by Mr. Fechner. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? No. Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you. So we moved on. To, oh, I am so sorry, Mr. Jelensic. Um, I have a comment from uh, Mr. Jelensic. You can come down to this microphone. I apologize. I got so excited that we were finally done. J.J. Jelancic, CalPERS member, former board member. Um, I, I will tell you that my time on the board really was about 90%. Um, now I got reimbursed for 100% because the, what wasn't particularly desirable that I go to my work site and talk to worker bees. Um, I learned things that board members probably shouldn't know. So I got reimbursed for 100%. Um, so I was going to encourage you to raise David's you did that um, but what I really want to talk about was legislation I think you ought to pursue that when I was on the board I encouraged that um, I suspect part of the reason it didn't fly was because of who was the proponent was um, but you need to address not just a, the appointed Henry is an elected um, but he's not you know, he only is getting the, th the same as the appointed. Uh, Richard Costigan, who's from SPB, gets nothing. And if you want people to do the work, then, you know, we ought to pay appropriately. Um, years ago, Dave Elder actually proposed legislation that allowed the board to set its own salaries. Um, I will tell you, he had a devious purpose for that and that was he thought you would set your salaries high enough that you would all get thrown off the board. Um, but there is, uh, 
there is something that really needs to be thought about in this legislation, but don't forget Henry in, in the process. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jelensic. All right. So moving on to uh, agenda item 6B. And it is an action. Almost everything's an action. I'm sorry, Mr. Osbo. Oh, no. You're right. Yeah, this is IT. Mr. Farland and Mr. Benson. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Christian Farland, uh, CalPERS team member. With me today is CalPERS Chief Technology Officer, Dirk Benson. Uh, our request today is for authorization to extend our current backup and restoration disaster recovery contract uh, an additional three months. The current contract expires June 30th. Uh, we, as many of you know, we've, we have entered into a contract with a new service provider for our backup and recovery uh, support. Uh, however, we're on a very tight time frame to that. So from a risk mitigation perspective, we are looking to have that, that uh, implemented by June 30th. If we were not to meet that time frame, we would be without a uh, backup and recovery scenario, uh, and we don't feel that that is uh, good business, nor does it meet our requirement of state law. So we're requesting an additional three months as a, an insurance policy. That concludes our comments. If there's any questions, we'd like to answer them. So very quick, quickly, myself, I uh, do have a question for you. So if you're asking for three additional months Correct. for the current contractor, but if you are able to implement with the new contractor timely, you are you <laughs> going to cancel that? You're that not is correct. Pay? Yes. And th and there is something in the contract that states we're, that we're 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 waiting as long as we can before we actually execute this. So this is request for authorization. We're not we're not necessarily entering into that. We may, but we need your approval to be able to do that because this is beyond the the term of the current contract. So my concern is that we're not double paying for Correct. We will work. not double pay. Okay. All right, Mr. Gillahan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, disaster recovery is a, a sort of a non-discretionary business cost, and um, for that reason, I move the staff recommendation. Second. Okay, the motion was moved by Mr. Gillahan, seconded by Mr. Costigan. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? All right, motion carries. We're moving on to seven, actuarial reporting. And Mr. Tarando. our famous actuaries. <laughs> good, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Scott Tarando, Kelper's team member. We have, we have for you today two action items. Um, the first item, which will be presented by Kelly Sturm, will go over the state valuation from 2017 and this will establish the 1819 fiscal year contribution rates. <laughs> After that, Randy Zubak will present the school's valuation, which will also establish the contribution rates for the 1819 fiscal year. With that, I'll pass along to Kelly at this point. Uh, thank you, Scott. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Kelly Sturm, CalPERS team member. Uh, today I'm going to present to you the results of the state annual valuation report and the employer and employee contribution rates that we're recommending for the 2018-19 fiscal year. Um, so this, in general, um, there are five state plans. Um, they're listed on the screen above, um, but school employees are considered part of a separate valuation, so Randy's gonna go over that next with his presentation. Um, there were a number of notable events over the last year since the last valuation. Um, so first, the investment return, the PERF earned an 11.2% investment return during the 2016-17 fiscal year, so that had some positive results on the valuation. Uh, secondly, the board adopted some new actuarial assumptions at its December <laughs> 2017 meeting. These included demographic assumptions, so those are assumptions related to, say, retirement rates or mortality. Um, and also the board adopted a new inflation assumption. Um, that is going to be phased in over a two-year period from 2.75% down to 2.5%. 
This valuation reflects an inflation assumption of 2.625, so that's the first step of that inflation assumption decrease. Uh, the third notable event was that the state made an additional $6 billion contribution towards the paying down of the unfunded liability. And uh, lastly, um, the board adopted changes to the amortization policy in February. Um, this valuation does not reflect those changes because those are slated to first impact the June 30th, 2019 valuation that we'll bring to you in about two years. So going back to that $6 billion additional contribution by the state, um, SB 84 directed the state to contribute it in three installment payments, uh, $2 billion at a, at a time. So to date, $4 billion has been paid in and the last remaining payment of $2 billion is scheduled to come in today. Um, it was allocated amongst the plans roughly based mm -hmm. on their share of the state's unfunded liability as of June 30th, 2016. Obviously the numbers have been rounded, um, but it's roughly based on that. Um, and because this valuation is as of June 30th, 2017, and those contributions were made after that date, the asset value and the funded status do not reflect that contribution. Um, but we are able to build it into the 2018-19 fiscal year contribution rates because we know that the money's coming in. So that's had a, a pretty positive impact on those contribution rates. So looking at the overall results of the valuation, um, the state plans, you know, the sum of the five plans has about $122 billion of assets <laughs> in the PERF. Um, the accrued liability measures about $180 billion, so that leaves an unfunded liability of about 58 to $59 billion. Uh, you'll also see that the contributions from 2017-18 to 2018-19 are expected to increase, but we knew that already. Um, there's a number of reasons for the increase. Uh, a big part of it is what we call the progression of the amortization basis. Um, our amortization policy does ramp in a number of costs over a five-year period, so due to the ramping effect, we are seeing increases in contributions. This valuation was also based on a discount rate of seven and a quarter percent, which is a reduction in discount rate from seven and three-eighths of the last valuation. If you'll recall, in December of 2016, the board reduced the discount rate from seven and a half down to seven percent in a three-step process. So this is the second step of those three. Um, and then the third reason for the increase in contributions is that the growth of the payroll across the plans, it grew about 3.7%, which is a reasonable amount, but it's causing you know, an increase in contributions. Um, the increase in contributions was at offset by a number of factors as well. It would have been larger, but we did receive the 11.2% investment return. The state contributed the $6 billion and then we're seeing new members entering into lower benefit formulas you know, due to PEPRA. Um, so those are bringing costs down, you know, offsetting some of the increases that we, we would be expecting to see. So uh, this slide has an overall look at what the contribution rates are that we're recommending to be adopted. These are the rates that are on page two of the agenda item. Um, you'll notice that the rates are increasing largely due to the reasons I just talked about in terms of the contribution dollar amounts. But they are, for four out of the five plans, lower than what we projected in the annual valuation report. So that's a little bit of good news. Uh, also on page six of the annual value, of the agenda item, um, we do have more information um, there's an additional statutory contribution that the state has to make due to government section code 20683.2. That was added during pension reform when member contribution rates were increased and the state is required to take any savings that they would have realized due to those member contribution rate increases and send it in as an additional contribution towards the unfunded liability. Um, this is subject to appropriation by the state during the annual budget act and is not something that we're recommending be adopted by the board because that's a separate process that the state has to take. So this is just provided for information. So moving on to the funded status of the plans. Um, <laughs> the funded status is in general, you know, a me measure for the overall health of the plans. 
Every plan has its own funded status, but across the state plans as a whole, it's about 67.4% funded as of June 30th, 2017. That's an increase of about 2.3% from the prior year. And again, this doesn't reflect the $6 billion additional contribution, so that should have a positive impact for the next valuation. Moving on to member contribution rates, there is a recommended change to the member contribution rates uh, for a subset of the employees. Um, if you'll recall, most state employees are actually exempt from the PEPR requirement that the members pay 50% of total normal cost. But there are three groups that are not exempt from this. They are the employees of the legislature, the California State University, and the judicial branch. Um, their member contribution rate is slated to change when the total normal cost increases by more than 1% from the last time it was set. Uh, so for these groups, they did reach the threshold of the 1% and we're recommending a contribution increase from six and a half to seven and a quarter. This is just for the state miscellaneous members in those employers. Uh, the information is detailed in attachment seven, but I should also note that there are some members in the peace officer firefighter category that are subject to this, but their threshold only went up by 0.9. Um, but it's looking like it's possible that next year they may see a member contribution rate increase because we are lowering the discount rate again. So lastly, uh, we did put in a projection of future contribution rates. Um, in the next year, it looks like they're going to increase again. Um, this is largely due to the discount rate change from seven and a quarter down to 7%. But if you'll notice in the later years, it does seem to be leveling off quite a bit. Um, the $6 billion additional contribution from the state went towards paying down these discount rate changes. So it is taking you know, several layers that would have been ramped out of the picture, so now the contribution rates aren't increasing quite as much as they would have. Uh, we are expected to put out a full valuation report this summer that will have information about our assumptions, our methods, and the participant data, and we'll also have a revised projection that includes the investment return uh, from the 2017-18 fiscal year. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. All right. Thank you very much for your presentation. I just had one quick question before I go on to one of our other committee members. Um, on page 9 of 10, member contributions for the PEPPER group in the state plans are going from 6.5 to 7.25 percent, effective July 1, 2018. Um, do we have an idea of how many members that impacts by any chance? Um, we don't have that information. Okay. I'm just, I, I can gather it for you and get back yeah, to you. I'm just a little curious as to how many members that's currently going to impact that also. Uh, I, I know we planned for it. it it's just that uh, it seems like it's going to be a, a, a ding on people's salaries, and mm -hmm. that does concern me. Anyway, Mr. Jones. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, uh, first question is, um, I know this is a state actuarial evaluation, but uh, the one percent, uh, the, the growth of one percent, then the member shares and the increased contribution. You talk about the state; these three categories uh, that are not exempt. Well, but the, what that provision affect all school and all cities and counties uh, uh, employees? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Pepper, yeah, hired after January 2015, I think, or something 13, like that. 13, yes. Okay, okay, yeah. Uh, the second question is I, I know that we're looking at the state unfunded liability, and we're also looking at the, uh, the school's unfunded liability. You okay? Yes. <laughs> okay, I know we're looking at the, um, uh, state's unfunded liability, 58, approximately 58 billion, and then looking at the uh, schools of approximately 23.6 billion. So, what is the uh, local agents, uh, public agencies' unfunded liabilities? So I could get a total number. Do you know? 
uh, we don't know that information offhand. The reason I'm asking because there have been some, I think, incorrect information in the LA Times about mm -hmm. CalPERS's unfunded liability, and I just want to get the right number so I can send them a note to correct it. So we can have yeah. direct yes. okay. staff to do that. Yeah. To your question, um, we're, we're right in the middle of the process of working on the public agency evaluations okay. right now, and usually um, our goal is to kind of wrap up the, the vows by the um, July time frame. So we can get you an um, we can get you an estimate now, okay. and then um, in July we can get you more okay, accurate numbers. Because I think the number I remember in the LA Times was 140 billion dollars, and if I'm already with 82 for two thirds of our fund, then how do I get to 140? You know. Okay. All right. Uh, if I may, Ms. Taylor, we just received the information that there's about 15,000 members that are subject to that provision of PEPRA that will have their member rate increase. Okay, thank you very much. As of June 30th, 2017, 15,000. 15,000? Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Uh, seeing no other questions, and this is an action item. Move uh, approval. And, uh, all right, moved by Mr. Jones and seconded by Mr. Gillahan. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? All right, motion carries. Moving on to 7B, schools valuation employee contributions. Mr. Toronto, or are you presenting? Um, uh, Randy Zubek will go ahead and present this item. Randy, thanks. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Randy Zubek, Kelper's actuarial team. I will run through a very similar presentation for the school's pool that you just heard uh, from Kelly on the state valuation. This also is a June 30, 2017 valuation, so assets and data collected as of that date. Uh, as with the state valuation, there is a one-year lag between the valuation date and the year for which our required contributions are due, which will be uh, fiscal year 2018-19. Uh, one difference with the school's pool is we value the pool as a whole. So all schools, all school districts are combined. We do a total valuation. We compute a one total required employer contribution that everybody pays. As far as significant events since the last valuation, many of these are similar to those that Kelly talked about with regard to the state plan. We also received an 11.2% return for the year ending June 30, 2017, which is good news, of course. With regard to the assumption changes that were adopted in December of 2017, and again, these are demographic assumptions, mortality, retirement, uh, as well as the inflation assumption. Uh, we're doing something a little bit differently for the school's pool. If, if you remember when the discount rate decision was made to lower from 7.5 to 7% over a three-year period, there was also a decision made to delay that schedule for the school's pool by one year. So the school's valuation is taking its first decrease in its discount rate in this valuation, whereas the state uh, is taking its second decrease. And so to remain consistent with the implementation of the discount rate changes, we are delaying these demographic changes until the 18 valuation. So the 17 results that we'll talk about do not reflect these changes, although they're expected to have a minor impact on the results. Uh, however, our projections at the end of the presentation do reflect these changes. And as Kelly said, with regard to the amortization policy changes recently adopted, you will see no impact of those in this presentation. You will not see any impact of those changes until we do the 630-2019 valuations. So looking at the main results of, of the valuation this year, our assets have increased from about 55 billion to 60 to 61 billion. Uh, much of that increase is due to the 11.2% the return for the year, which was higher than our expected return. Accrued liabilities have increased from 77 billion to about 84 billion. You can also think of that as the funding target. We call it accrued liability, but that's ideally where we would like the assets to be for all of our plans. Um, we do expect a normal increase in that number just due to the passage of time, but we also took our first decrease in the discount rate, so that contributed to the increase in the accrued liability. Our unfunded liability has grown a little bit as a dollar amount, but it actually has reduced a little bit as a percentage of our funding target, which you can see uh, by the funding status having increased from 71.9 to 72.1%. Now, with regard to required employer contributions, we are increasing from a, a, a rate determined last year of 15.531%. So that's the rate that folks are currently paying. We are going to go to 18.062% for the year beginning 7 one 
uh, and that looks like a material increase, and it is a material increase, but much of that, as with the state valuation, much of that is due to uh, items that we knew about last year, a couple years worth of uh, investment losses, um, the first of our discount rate changes, and the associated ramps that we use that phase in the cost of those items over a five-year period. So we're, we're increasing every year um, in our contribution rate as a result of those items that already occurred until we hit the top of the five-year ramp. We did project, our most recent projection based on last year's data was 17.7% for the employer rate. So we are coming in a little bit higher than that, and that's the result of just collecting new demographic data and running through all of our valuation software. The PEPRA member contribution rate is also increasing, as it is for state members, from 65 to 7%. So as Mr. Jones mentioned, um, the 50% requirement is in place for schools, for public agencies, but the number is calculated specifically for each group. It's half, generally half of the normal cost of that group. So that's why ours is going to 7%, the state rate was seven and a quarter. Slide five provides a little bit more information on the required contribution. We've got it split between normal cost and unfunded liability. Normal cost is generally the, the ongoing required rate to fund the accrual of benefits for your active workforce so that we fully fund benefits from entry age to retirement age. So if the plan was 100% funded, that would be your total contribution or the school's total contribution, the normal cost component. Now, when our assets fall short of our funding targets, we have to make a payment towards the unfunded liability, and that's what the 9.323% is for. So actually this year, our payment towards unfunded liability actually exceeds uh, the payment towards normal cost. Now, with regard to the projected dollar amounts, we simply project payroll based on what we have. We don't know what payroll will be uh, for the year starting July 1st, 2018, but we do a projection and we apply the rates above and, and we come up with estimates for the dollar contributions, which are increasing from about two billion this year to almost two and a half for next year. The recent history of funded status has kind of the same shape as the state valuation. We hit a peak of 86.6% .6 as of June 30, 2014, and then we had a couple years of uh, asset performance lower than our expected return, which drove the funded status down. Uh, and now we're seeing a little bit of an increase this year uh, from 71.9 to 72.1. Uh, that's generally due to the 11.2% return being offset by the impact of taking the first discount rate change. Now, with regard to PEPRA members, I'll give a little bit more detail on that calculation. Uh, as I said, the required member rate is generally half of the total normal cost of, of the PEPRA group, subject to some additional rules. One of those rules is that if the normal cost increases by something less than 1%, there's no change in the member rate. So there has to be an increase of at least 1%. Uh, the increase that we experienced this year was from 12.91% to 14.07%. So we just crossed that 1% 1 uh, 1 barrier, which required the, the increase in the member rate. So we then take half of the 14%, which is where the 7% comes from. Uh, good news is, uh, as far as our projections go, um, and this assumes things play out as our assumptions would predict, uh, we don't expect that 7% over the next few years to to, to increase. That's not saying that it, it won't or it can't, but um, on a projected basis, um, we think it might stay at 7% for a couple years. Okay, and lastly, we just wanna look at the projected rates going forward. Uh, we don't show the current year result here, but remember that was 18.062%. Uh, and then slide eight then shows projected rates going forward all the way through year 2025, 20, 26. We see a steeper increase in rates uh, from now through uh, the second from last year, uh, going all the way up to 26%. Um, that's a little bit steeper of an increase than the state plan, but as Kelly mentioned, the, the state projections were helped by the additional $6 billion contribution. Um, by the time we get to that second row from the bottom, we're at the top of all of our ramps with regard to investment losses and discount rate changes that we know of. And so at that point, we don't expect increases going forward. In fact, we expect a little bit of a decrease as uh, more classic members turn over and are replaced by PEPRA members who generally cost us less. 
so with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. I'm seeing no questions from the committee right now, so I'd like to entertain a motion for the recommended action. Move it. <laughs> Moved by Mr. Jones, seconded by Mr. Gillahan. On, on the recommendation for the school's uh, evaluation employer employee contribution rates, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? All right, motion carries. Thank you very much. All right, we are moving on to... Oh, we do have one public comment. I'm sorry. Carlos Machado, California School Boards. Are you still here? Yes, you are. And you'll have three minutes on that mic, yeah. I think. <coughs> Good morning. Carlos Machado with the California School Board Association. Appreciate the time to ad address you on this item. Um, we recognize how this uh, proposal fits into the funding for the plan. Uh, we're not here to speak against the item. Just wanted, we feel to our obligation to highlight what impact this would have on schools in California. Uh, the increase from 1718 to 1819, about 450 million, rep represents about uh, $60 per student. Um, for a, a school the size of a school of 500, that's about $30,000. Uh, in the era where we're at right now with funding reaching pre-recession levels. Um, it's really having an impact, uh, not just uh, the pension costs, but other employer costs. Um, right now we're 41st in per, per pupil funding, 45th in uh, pupil teacher ratios, and 48th in uh, pupil staff ratios. So uh, um, we're finding that as these costs increase, we're having to either cut programs or reach into our reserves. Um, we'll be working with uh, policymakers in the state to try to get funding uh, outside of Prop 98 to help us with these impacts. Uh, but we wanted to just highlight um, the impact that these are having on the classroom and on students and appreciate working with you and your staff um, to, to address these issues going forward. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mr. Machado. Moving on to um, 8A, Program Administration, Semi-Annual Health Plan Financial Report. And that, Gary McCollum, Mr. McCollum. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Gary McCollum, CalPERS team. This is item 8A, semi-annual health plan financial report. It is an informational item. Uh, we summarize in this report the 2016 financial, excuse me, the 2017 financial results for the HMO flex funded plans and also the PPO plans. So I'll start with the PPO plans, uh, give you a brief a very brief um, overview of the highlights. Um, attachment one has the, the information for the PPO plans. Uh, actual reserves above the actuarial reserve requirements are about 120 million. Uh, overall, that's a ratio of assets to reserves of 120%. And for comparison purposes in, in 2016, that ratio was at 118%. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So medical claims costs for the basic plan are on the rise uh, in 2017. They range from six to 10%. Uh, for the Medicare plans, the choice Medicare is a concern. It has a medical cost train trend at 10%, but the other two are, are doing just fine. Uh, pharmacy claims costs are all very favorable. <laughs> all of them currently are at a negative trend. Uh, that's the primarily the benefit of changing to better pricing with Optum in 2017. And enrollment uh, increased by just 1.3% uh, over 2016 enrollment. So moving to the HMO plans uh, in 2017, assets for the HMO plans totaled just over 200 million, and that was an increase of 109 million from the end of 2016. Additional subsidies and rebates, and also some risk transfer payments uh, account for 
the majority of that uh, increase. Uh, medical and pharmacy claims costs are shown on pages four and five of attachment two. And as I have stated in previous uh, reports, the large movement that has occurred over the past several years in the HMO plans makes analysis of the claims costs for the individual plans very difficult to interpret. So I'm, I'll just give you the, uh, the information in total. And unfortunately, I have to report that uh, the pharmacy costs that are on page five uh, for the total, not for the individual. The individual plans, those amounts are correct, but the box in the lower right-hand corner, total all plans, those numbers are in error. I'm Oops. sorry to report. Uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me. They will be corrected in the next report, and the only good news about having to report that error is that the trend for the pharmacy which according to that, in an overall basis, looks pretty bad, actually was very good. It was 1.3% when you make the correction for the numbers. Um, the medical costs increased a total of 5% in 2017. So total enrollment in the HMO plans decreased by about 28,000, and that was primarily due to the elimination of uh, Blue Shield's net value plan. So the, the new plans, uh, which had been increasing significantly over the years from 2014 through 2016, had a much smaller increase in 2017. So that concludes my report. If there's any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Seeing no questions from the committee, Thank that you. was an information item. I do have one person from the public that wants to speak on 8A, and that's Mr. Woodson. Thank you. If we could turn on that microphone. <laughs> Good morning, Larry Woodson, California State Retirees. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you for the opportunity to comment this morning. Uh, I have brief comments, uh, just some observations and one point <clears throat> I'd like to make regarding the uh, analysis of the PPO plans and the actual reserve amount. Um, as Mr. Collier reported, uh, a total reserve of 729 million. Um, the required reserves are 609.8 million, which to a, a lay stakeholder seems like a lot of money, but I'm sure CalPERS feels like it's a prudent amount uh, for some catastrophic event or a pandemic. Um, but the fact that the reserves above the actual, uh, actuarial required amount have consistently been um, over $100 million. The last semi-annual report was $106 million, um, and now they're 100 and about $120 million. Um, I think that to have that kind of money sitting there, and I understand that there may be some proposals to the board uh, upcoming for transfer of that money to beneficial use. But the point I'd like to make is that over this period of time where this surplus to the surplus has existed in, in a pretty large quantity, there have been proposals before this board to double and triple the amount of op uh, out of pocket expenses to members covered by these plans in the form of increased deductibles and, and uh, co insurance and, and co pays. And, and I, I appreciate the fact that the staff took stakeholder input and greatly reduced the amount of those increases. Uh, they did l double the increases to select, as you know, with the opportunity to bring them down with uh, rebates. But um, I, I just think you will have before you this week, uh, today, in the next committee meeting, uh, I think a proposal to uh, almost double co-pays for PERS care and PERS uh, choice. So to have that kind of surplus and at the same time uh, taking money out of our pockets, uh, I, I guess I would just say what's wrong with that picture? Uh, and I, I would ask you to 
to perhaps look at that inconsistency as well. You'll be hearing more from us in the next uh, committee meeting on rates, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Mr. Woodson. All right, moving on to 8B, reporting on participating employers. And for that, I'm looking for Arnita Page and Andy Nguyen. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Arnita Page, my CalPERS, excuse me, CalPERS team member. Agenda item AB provides updates on reporting on participating employers. This update includes the committee's direction to provide a revenue funding source column in the JPA summary report and provide the status of Peril Fire Protection District. Andy Nguyen, Assistant Chief of Pension Contract Services, is here to assist with presenting this item. I would like to direct your attention to our presentation. Slide two, our Joint Power um, Authority report provides an update on our ongoing efforts to identify the number of contracting JPEs and our review of the JPA agreements. We identified a total of 162 contracting JPAs, of which we now have 152 JPA agreements, which increased from 149 when we last reported. Nine of the JPA agreements do not contain a clause that indemnifies the public agencies forming or participating in the JPA from having its liabilities revert back to those member agencies. The last two columns addresses the committee's direction in December to add revenue source information. These, these JPAs receive some level of funding from their member agencies. 86 receive much of their funding from taxes or fees or a combination of both. And 66 receive the majority of their funding from their member agencies. Now I will provide an update on our ongoing review of our contracts with agencies with no active members reported to the system. This slide provides a summary of the population. These agencies are all current on their pension obligations. The next slide provides our progress. Starting with the left column, we received notice of intent to terminate from four agencies. Three of the agencies have dissolved or ceased operations, and one merged their function with another non-CalPERS participating agency. Additional information regarding these agencies will be provided on our termination report on the next slide. Under the employer engagement and review column, there's two agencies that we are having internal discussions with um, they're considering termination. And one of the two agencies in our stop reporting payroll column has not provided the Employer Account Services Division with requested information. In response, a final demand letter will be sent to them shortly. The Employer Account Service Division is also working with one, the, the last employer in this, in this group um, to verify membership information. Moving to the next column, we continue to assess and monitor these agencies. Um, we have, a, and I'm referring to the ones with the 152 total. Um, they are, I wanna again reiterate that they are current on their pension obligations. They have valid service agreements or have outsourced operations or they're active members or in another defined benefit system. To improve clarity and, and, and transparency, we made changes to our report on agencies who are in the process of voluntarily terminating the system since we last reported. We added the agency type, number of members, and the date termination cost is due, and the date the cost is either paid in full or we have a settlement in plan, I mean, incidentally, a settlement plan in place. We will provide an update on Herald Fire Protection District in our collection report update. 
Here are the names of the four agencies who provided their intent to voluntary terminate, and these agencies plan to resolve their termination cost. So can I stop you sure. for just a moment? I have a question from a committee member. Absolutely. So I just, I'd like to know more about Central Sierra Planning Council. Looks like they actually did a notice to terminate in 2011. How was this? Little? Sure. Um, we had they we had some discussions. Central Sierra actually um, fell delinquent about a year ago, and we had discussions with them. They were considering terminating their contract, but um, they recently contacted us. Um, early last year stating that they wanted to terminate and they were working with their member agencies to do so. So they are, they, they're more in motion in terms of they plan to terminate their contract and they discussed that they plan to send us a final resolution to terminate shortly. Okay, I'm sorry. It says the notice of intent to terminate was in 2011. Yes. Eight years ago. Yes. So did they move to terminate in 2011? No, what they, no, they did not. Okay. They recently contacted us and said they want to move forward with termination. They filed it, changed their mind, and then That's now right. they're considering they want to seriously terminate their contract. Are they current? Yes, they are. Okay, so um, I, I just, again, it's the amount of information. I thought when you provided the notice of termination, it actually set the wheels in motion and you couldn't reverse it. You know. Um, they, they can file an intent to terminate, but uh -huh. until they final they they, um, so they issue the final termination, um, they haven't terminated. So the, the intent to terminate is to notify us that they intend to terminate, and then the notice and then the final resolution to terminate. Once that's completed, that's when the contract is actually terminated. So Lebronza Bra Water District Central Coast Computing. Uh, they've merely sent us a notice that it's intent to do that. We've set nothing in motion, but the Herald Fire District, in fact, has moved to terminate. Correct. Okay. We may just want to clean it up a little bit. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Any? Jones, did you want to talk on this? No. I'll wait until she finished this first section. Okay. Re do your microphone. Go ahead. Oh, Go ahead. I'm done with the termination report. Is this where the question was? I'm sorry. I want to make sure. Oh, if you are on. done? Yes. I need you to press your button again. Thank you. The question was on the last frame, uh, the okay. legislative strategy. Oh, okay. It's, sure. So um, the uh, when we had our, uh, uh, I guess, update on our legislative uh, report last month, we um, were advised that uh, we had set in motion the requirement for new JPAs to have the financial liability mm -hmm. included in their contract. And so when I looked at this last page for legislative strategy, I was wondering why the financial liability wasn't listed here as one of our strategies from a legislative point of view. Okay. Um, the This actual legislation is what we're sponsoring is to shorten the time frames for your voluntary terminations. Um, to 90 days, and I think that the prior slide, uh, when we talked a little bit about um, Central Sierra Planning Council, that's another reason why we wanted to shorten the time frames and not allow agencies so long to, because they, they have to wait a year before they finalize their termination. What this legislation does is shortens the time frame and requires notification, which is a separate legislation from the JPAs. Okay. You know, we're not, so yeah, I, we're not I, I, that's sponsoring being sponsored it. Yeah, someone by else. someone else. Oh, okay, okay. And so you mentioned that we have nine new JPAs. Uh, how many new JPAs do we have? Well, we in had the current two, year. We had two new JPAs who requested to contract with us, but they haven't moved forward with that. So, are there provisions to require the financial liability back to the sponsoring agency? We do. We have okay. been enforcing that with our new contracting process. Mm -hmm. Yes, we okay. have. Thank you. Yes, sir. You're welcome. Okay. All right. Thank you. Hold on one second. I have um, sure. a request uh, for uh, someone for for someone from the public to speak. Okay. Mr. Gibbons from California Special Districts Association on this item. Make sure it's in the It says a. I thought that was it. Is it on this part? 
time? Uh, well, yeah, it would, it would have been a few pages away, but it's a little so bit to, to Henry Jones. Uh, oh, okay, uh, then I'm going to let you speak. So uh, I may jump ahead and, and point to a slide 15, if that's, if that's okay. Um, so, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee, Dylan Gibbons, the California Special Districts uh, Association. Uh, I would like to thank the, the board and this committee for <laughs> working with local governments on the legislation, on the notification legislation, SB 1022. We were able to remove our opposition uh, by working with us on the timelines to provide the information uh, to our members and the retirees. Um, but I would like to, again, here jump, jump ahead to slide uh, 15, which was initially when there was discussion on legislation related to JPAs and assigning that liability. Uh, it was that slide that, that this board primarily was looking at for their uh, rationale behind doing that. Um, as was mentioned, with JPAs that are now uh, contracting with CalPERS, uh, they're now including that liability. We have no concerns with uh, new JPAs forming, having that assigned. We do have grave concerns with uh, the assigned uh, retroactive liability. Um, I would like to, there's a lot of different concerns with that, and in a minute and 43 seconds, I'm not going to have that time, but I would like to uh, have you, if you took the legislation that is going through the legislature right now, that I believe this board is gonna be considering taking a position on next month, if you applied that to the LA Works contracts, uh, I don't believe you'd see any different outcome. Uh, what would happen is the CalPERS would go to the member agencies and say, hey, uh, you need to take on proportional liability. They would look at it and say, why would we take on $19 million in, in liability over a JPA that is entirely funded by grant funds? So they'd say no. CalPERS would then tell the, uh, tell the JPA, you need to amend your contract to assign that liability. They say they can't. Then the CalPERS would say, would be forced to close that contract and under this legislation would have no alternative other than to cut the benefits of the retirees, then sue the member agencies in order to recover the $19 million. Uh, unfortunately, because there is no contract between CalPERS and the member agencies, they would not be able to recover those funds. So in the end, there would be no different outcome. However, if we applied the same legislation to all the other JPAs, instead of JPAs retirees getting their money, there would be more JPAs shutting down for the same result. So think of that, that when, while you're considering uh, supporting the legislation next month. Um, and thank you very much for your time. And again, thank you for working with us on this. I appreciate your time. All right, so I wanna know before I move on to the rest of the um, 8B, is this a, uh, Mr. Koskin? Do you need to speak no, on this? Right okay. Mr. Jones? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Wait, wait, wait. I didn't click enough. There you go. <laughs> okay, thank you, Madam Chair. The legislation that I was referring to about the JPA's financial law, the provisions that we were requesting, did it include retroactivity uh, implications? Oh, here we go. Matt? Yes. Yes, it did. It would apply retroactively. Okay. 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 So maybe if we have the presentation, it'll help clarify. Yeah. So go ahead. Mr. Nguyen, I think, is next. Okay. We'll move on to the collections report. Okay. Our collection report provides the activity for December 1st through um, February 28th. We are actively working with the agencies to resolve the outstanding amounts on this report. Most of these outstanding amounts are operational issues and they're solvable. Um, we want to talk, I would like to move to um, the termination cost payment. Um, the delinquent, um, delinquency that we see here is, is regarding Herald Fire excuse me, Protection District. Um, they owe $404,000 for termination costs that became due on January 20th. We met with the district's representative and the board president to discuss the amounts owed. On April 18th, their board will discuss a plan of action to settle amounts owed to the system. When, when we provided the committee our overview of the pension program, we informed the committee that our next step 
was to review our 1,366 contracts with schools. Andy will provide information on our charter school population and the contract process. Good morning, Andy Nguyen. Good morning, Andy Nguyen, CalPERS team members. <laughs> so currently, when the charter school elect to participate in the CalPERS defined benefit pension plans, um, we will go through the LGBA process, and if they, are, if they are eligible, we will treat them just like any public school district, and they will um, enroll their employees to CalPERS uh, via the County of, Ed County of Education's uh, contract. Uh, today, um, we have identified 422 charter schools in our system, and um, all of the charter schools is, uh, are part of our school pool. They are receiving the pension costs um, in the same manner as other public um, school um, as a percentage of pay, and they are paid to the County Office of Education. Um, this slide will show you um, a, a summary of our contracting process for charter school. So on January 23rd, 2015, the Internal Revenue Services and Treasury Department issued a notice uh, entitled the relief for certain participants in the government plans of 414D. It's also known as the charter school relief. Since then, we have implemented a, a new contracting process for charter school, and one of the process is we require them to sign a certification letter to say that if, when the IAS issue the final um, guideline for um, governmental plan, if they are not complying with CalPERS, they have to um, certify that they will change the charter to be in compliance. So, currently, um, if if the charter school closed or start reporting uh, their employees to CalPERS, all of their assets and liability remain in the school pools. Um, the current law doesn't have an, um, um, any provision for terminations. Um, at last, um, just the last couple of months, we received two requests from the charter school representative to, uh, to terminate from um, the contract with CalPERS, and we have informed them that the current law doesn't have any provision for them to terminate from the school pool. With that, I conclude my presentation. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Um, in terms of next steps, we will continue to we will continue to monitor the agencies with all inactive uh, members and pursue legislation strategy for the voluntary terminations and present our update in September. This concludes our presentation. We're happy to answer any questions. Okay. And we do have questions from the committee members and one from a non-committee member. Mr. Jones? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, again. So what happened to the employees uh, in the charter school when you say they can't terminate, so they stop sending money? So what happened to those members? Those employees actually remain in the pool. So um, they, it's almost it, what happens is um, the the charter school um, stops reporting their payroll, but the employees that are in the school pool do remain in the pool. So are they accumulating service credits? No, they, they will stop accruing additional service, but they accrued service will remain in the school yeah. pool. At, at that point. Yes. Right. So are those recruit. employees notified that they're not earning service credits when they terminate like that? Well, they were, though. Um, well, at this time, we're not sure mm -hmm. if the um, charter school has mm -hmm. most likely the reason they didn't report employees because they has closed. Yeah. Well, I would just suggest uh, then, that just like the JPAs, we don't want to, if a group of employees come and say, I had no idea that I was not earning credit, so I think, it, Madam I, Chair, it should be some way to. I, I think that, you know, and I can request one of my team members to come up to handle this payroll, but I believe when a, a, the school puts an end date in the employee's um, service, I believe a notification is generated, but I can request yeah, assistance. Yeah, request so, that. Yeah, yeah. And, and because what I see as a problem here is po the possibility of the charter school pulling out because mm -hmm. they don't want to pay into the pension, but still operating. So Correct. these people, if that's the case, then these people may not even know they no longer have a pension. Yeah. So I think it is incumbent upon us to at least notify those, those employees. 
Um, um, hold on one second. And Ms. Paquin. Thank you, Madam Chair. I had a question on the charter schools as well, too. And of the two conversations you've had recently where they wanted to voluntarily terminate, were these individual schools or large charter school operators? You can go ahead, Dave. Um, it's, it's a large school operators in the, uh, one of them is in San Diego County, and the other one is um, uh, across like four or five different counties. So are they going to continue to report payroll and, and pay into the system, or how have you left that conversation? They haven't socialized that to us. What happened is these schools actually contacted us to request the termination costs, and when we stated that there was um, no provision in the law to provide the termination <laughs> costs, we redirected them back to their COE. To, so they didn't socialize to us whether or not they were going to just stop, you know, stop reporting. Okay, and um, I'm also curious if you've done any analysis to see if you are still receiving um, requests from charter schools to join CalPERS at the same rate as you were before, or have you seen that they're starting to use other retirement options? Well, I, I, what I can say is that um, we, we have 14 charter schools who want to enter the system right now, new requests that we processed. Okay, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mr. Fechner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Why wouldn't we seek legislation to make the charter schools, whoever granted the charter, be the holding property? So go back to the county office of ed, et cetera, to make these employees whole. That's a good question. Um, we did have a meeting with the um, Department of Education. We actually talked to STIRS to just to brainstorm about um, this issue, but I think that's something internally discussions in partnership with other stakeholders that we need to, to discuss, because we're just we've seeing this ourselves, you know, as an issue um, through our review, but it's something that we're having internal discussions about, and that did come up, but we haven't move forward with it. Well, I would recommend that we do move forward and quickly so that okay. this does continue to happen, just like what happened with the San Gabriel. We want to make sure we're protecting these members. Okay, thank you. And I just have a curiosity question before I move on to another um, person. Why do they come, why do charter schools come to us and not STIRS? Is there a reason that they? Can they're classified employees? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Have somebody. Go ahead, Matt. Thank you. I have a suggestion, which is to have my colleague, uh, Lisa. Yeah, thank you. I'm bad with last names, sorry. <laughs> Lisa Hammond Campos. up. Lisa Hammond Campos, Calpers team member. Um, I was hoping you could reframe the question. I believe you're asking whether or not a charter school, if they close, if the benefits are being reduced. And right now, with the way the school's They're pool not. is designed, the school's pool would bear the cost of the benefit. Therefore, there would be no reduction. That's the, if there are any assets are remaining or any liabilities, it's borne by the school's pool. That Hold on, Henry. Go ahead. So the accrual of benefits, though, does that continue? If the, if the school's pool, if the school has closed its doors or the school is no longer participating, there would be no more additional benefits creating going okay, forward, okay. but the accrued service would yeah, remain. Yeah, that part I understand. Yeah, and that's the part I think we should notify to be sure that the employee is aware that they're not a continuing to accrue benefits as a result of that action. And I think Mr. Fechner wanted yeah. to add to that. I do. I, I'm, not, I'm. My concern is that following into the process of the school's pool, it shouldn't be all the other school district responsibility to pay for that chartering agency's uh, decision. decision. So I think it should fall back on the chartering agency and that county <laughs> office of ed to make whole, not the school's pool. So by design, this, th that's effectively kind of what is happening when a charter school does close, the school's pool, the school chartering authority and on the COEs in the pool are paying for the rate. It's a so we have another but why are we person. Somebody else's rates? Well, how'd you go uh, off? I I didn't Good morning, Renee Ostrander, a CalPERS team member. And you want to um, again? 
In reference to um, your question, Mr. Jones, the members are made aware that they're no longer accruing benefits because what happens is the employer separates them in our system. And so when an employer separates a member in our system, we generate a letter to them and we let them know that they have options at separation. So if they're not separated, it would certainly generate that question by them, why have I been separated by my employer? So we do make them aware that they're not um, receiving any more benefits. That's fine. Because if they go and work for another school district, then they will continue to earn their benefits anyway, but it's those that don't continue to earn. Correct. So they are made aware by us that they have been separated in our system. Rob, mm -hmm. do you, you're good? Okay, Ms. Mother. Well, I, th I think this raises the a problem that in our current structure with the pool where sort of public schools are responsible for covering the cost of charter schools that may fail or may, turn, or may leave our system, and so, and that that is that is a bigger policy question. It's not really a Calpers question in terms of making sure that our members get their benefits paid for, but it's really a bigger policy question as to whether school districts should be, um, sh sh you know, should have to pay for for charter schools that are no longer in business, or for the obligations of charter schools that are no longer in business. Um, I, I, so anyway, I, th I think that is the sort of core of the of the issue here. Um, I don't know if you want to address And that. board mother, that is the type of, exactly the type of conversation we have been having with stakeholders to make sure they're aware of this issue and uh, hopefully take action to uh, address it. My guess is that boards of education who approve charters are not really fully aware of the long-term implications of the charters that they are allowing to move forward that and what my, and my the risks that well. they're bearing so to, there might be some communication effort that we should participate in at the very least if not um, legislation that we might be willing to support to better protect school districts we're certainly engaged in the communication effort all right seeing no further questions from the board is there anything else all right so um, we have hit our two-hour mark, so I'd like to call a break until 11.30, and we'll reconvene at 11.30. All right. Good. And then 15 minutes on Scott's item, and then break for lunch.